Welcome to my first episode of this lecture series about STEM and STEAM education. My name is André Brieskes. I'm a physics professor at this magnificent University of Cologne you see in the background. Since I am a science teacher, I want to understand the fundamental principles of my science before I teach it. 100 years before, there was another scientist in biology. He was set on the same journey. He wanted to make learning understandable from the perspective of biology. His name was Jean Piaget and he became famous in educational science. Piaget was observing kids and he proposed an intriguing mechanism about how kids acquire knowledge. When he watched his own kids, he saw that they first played around with all the objects that a household provided to them. After a while, he watches a pause in their play. Piaget assumed that during this pause, the internal representations of these objects are accommodated, so slightly changed so that they adapt better to the situation. His arguments were that the play of the kids showed slight variations every time when such a pause occurred. Look at this pattern for yourself. These principles were adopted by Piaget's student Hans Ebli. He formed the operational principle where students are actively engaged to construct knowledge. Students identify objects, operate with objects and test the impact of their operations on the objects and on the whole world around. Another student is a respected psychologist and mathematician, Seymour Papert. He founded the MIT Media Lab, he founded the programming language Lobo and he founded the Mindstorm approach that was so famously adopted as Lego Mindstorms. In physics education, Seymour Papert's student Andrea Di Sessa argued that phenomenological primitives, so-called p-primes, are the building blocks that learners are constructing their knowledge on. Therefore, he changed the way we look on what we used to call misconceptions. In Germany, it was Erich Wittmann uh, that adopted Piaget's theory for mathematics education. He uses an approach of having students identify mathematical objects, let them operate on these objects and assess the impact of different operations. <laughs> now, as a physicist and engineer, it is quite easy to understand the whole concept. It is so fundamental to the iterative development cycle used in engineering and so fundamental to the way physicists generate knowledge by a series of experiments. Can it be true that every kid is a researcher and an engineer by nature? If so, what is it that kills that principle that is so fundamental for human curiosity when we are coming of age? Part of my theory is that it is out of the lack of tools that kids have at their disposal. Think about what a grown-up physicist or engineer has as tools to work with. How he acts upon the world. He or she has an abundance of sensors to acquire data, to see more things. He might be an astrophysicist looking at faraway galaxies or a microbiologist looking at tiny molecular structures. The more things they see, the more pattern emerge. But there is another side to the operational theory. You have also be able to act upon the world. You have to provide tools to act on these objects, to vary parameters. More or less light, more or less water, more or less temperature, and then let's see what happens. Let's test if our models are right. So sensors and actors have to be provided according to each other. Get hands on with the box of sensors. Try to figure out what is the concept in physics that they are related to. Temperature sensors are connected to the concept of temperature, obviously. They are a useful tool to open the whole topic of thermal energy. But what is a temperature sensor actually measuring? All sensors, actors and connectors need to be intrinsically safe. Students must be able to play around with them, weight them in their hands to be inspired. If we have to stay one step behind them to make sure that they can't hurt themselves or the equipment, 
something is wrong with the equipment. If all looks right, you will be easily able to watch Piaget's circular reaction as a first principle of learning. Children learn by playing around with objects, find out what operations are possible and monitor the impact. How can you test what really works? How can you monitor the impact of your operations to learn how to teach? For once, you might use the Reform Teaching Observation Protocol by Dayado Savada, Michael Pyburn, Kathleen Falconer, Russell Benford and Noreen Bloom. In Rubik 3, Lessons Design and Implementation, you have four very important items. The lesson was designed to engage students as members of a learning community. Student exploration preceded formal presentation. This lesson encouraged students to seek and value alternative modes of investigation or of problem solving. And finally, the focus and direction of the lesson was often determined by ideas or relation with the students. Sounds familiar. How would you perform this measurement? We suggest to bring some of your peers, if students are out of the question, and record both your instruction and the operations of your students. Show the recording to other teachers and let them evaluate the lesson using one of their assessment tools. And if you just have a lot of sensors and actors and your mindset does not grow in the same pace like your possibilities, you are also missing something. You need a growth mindset that tells you, okay, I cannot make sense out of this today, but if I keep trying, it will start to make sense and show effects sooner or later. Helpful here are what I call mental tools, like a calculator, a spreadsheet where you can gather your data. Those mental tools are always tools of communication because science is a collective endeavor where you can visualize your data and where you can make sense of it together with other people. 